Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, we are delighted to have you here for our um, Christian Union webinar on the boundaries of humanity. My name is Christine Foster, and I am the Vice President of Alumni Engagement, and um, I'm just so pleased to welcome you. We had a great um, conversation with some of our Cornerstone partners before this, and we're just delighted to have the larger group here for this now. Um, I'd love to introduce my colleague, Karen Hetzler, um, who will pray us in for the evening, and then I'll move on to, to introductions. Good evening, welcome. We're so thankful that you all have chosen to join us tonight. Uh, as Christine said, we already had a phenomenal conversation um, with Dr. Hurlbut and the Cornerstone Partners at the pre-event, so we're looking forward to a lot more. And um, I'm Karen Hetzler, I'm the Assistant Ministry Director for Christian Union's New York Ministry. And this ministry is the Lord's and all that we do is for him. And so we wanna invite him into this conversation. Um, so let's just begin our evening with a word of prayer. Yeah, Father, you are faithful. Um, we praise you as creator. You are genius in your creation. You, um, your mind is far greater than what we can even begin to fathom. And so, Lord, as we gather to explore these ideas and to um, dig deeper into learning what it is that you have created and what are our limits and our boundaries as humans to, um, to take these things and use them and manipulate them, even for good, Lord, we invite your spirit to come now. You are the truth. We invite you to come and lead these conversations Lord, lead, even uh, we pray that you would put the questions on our hearts and in our minds that we as your people need to grapple with. Um, Lord, as we prayed in the, in the pre-event as well, God, we pray that you would help us to be salt and light, that you have called us to be. So God, use this time as yours as a time of equipping, a time of equipping of our hearts, of um, teaching our minds, inspiring us in spirit to live for you. and. Um, yeah, to be faithful stewards of what you've given to us. So bless this time and um, we bless our speakers in the name of Jesus, amen. Also, we wanna say a word of thank you to our Cornerstone partners. Uh, we are so, so very grateful for all of those of you who recognize the importance of the work that's being done to develop Christian leaders. And as we, I think, can all see leaders matter and we're through Christian Union doing what we can to um, develop and connect Christian leaders. And so we thank those of you who are already a part of this work with us. And we invite those of you who are not, you can be a part of this, this work as well in developing Christian leaders to be the voice and to, to have the kinds of platforms that we need to have, um, to have a Christian stamp on our culture. And so Christine, I think it's just put a link up in the chat and we would also direct you, encourage you toward, you know, if you live in the New York City area, please consider designating toward New York. So, the, so those gifts will go towards the work that are in your neck of the woods. If you're an alumni of one of our schools, please consider designating there. Um, and, or you can designate multiple places. So we just wanna make that available to you and we invite you to, to partner in this work with us. So um, Christine, I'll hand it back to you at this point. You can do introduction. That sounds great. Thank you so much. Um, so first I'd like to start by um, introducing William Hurlbut. He's a physician and adjunct professor in the Department of Neurobiology at Stanford University Medical Center. His primary areas of interest involve the ethical issues associated with advancing biomedical technology, the biological basis of moral awareness, and studies in the integration of theology and the philosophy of biology. He has worked with NASA on projects in astrobiology and on chemical and biological warfare at Stanford Center for International Security and Cooperation. He has chaired three interdisciplinary faculty projects at Stanford, Becoming Human, the Evolutionary Origins of Spiritual, Religious, and Moral Awareness, the second one is Brain, Mind, and Emergence. And the ongoing one, um, which we base our title off of, is The Boundaries of Humanity, Human, Animal, and Machines in the Age of Biotechnology. 
Um, in addition, he co-led um, a project called The Challenge and Opportunity of Gene Editing, a project for reflection, deliberation, and education. Um, from 2002 to 2009, Dr. Hurlbut served on the President's Council on Bioethics. So thank you, Dr. Hurlbut, for being with us. We're just delighted to have you. Thank you. Very nice to be with all of you. And we are pleased to introduce um, one of our youngest alums um, who is going to be in conversation with you this evening. Um, Angelica Du holds bachelor's and master's degrees in bioengineering from the University of Pennsylvania, where she researched neurobiology, tutored critical writing, directed a Disney themed acapella group, and most importantly, led weekly worship for Christian Union's ministry at Penn. Driven by her passion to innovate for good, Angelica is, per, is pursuing a career in biotechnology and drug discovery with the goals of empowering underrepresented groups in STEM and healing as many people as possible, physically and spiritually. Um, though a native of the San Francisco Bay Area, Angelica currently resides near Philadelphia working in vaccine manufacturing tech ops at Merck and Company. Welcome, Angelica. So um, I am actually going to turn it over and Karen and I are going to go off screen to Angelica so she can talk with Dr. Hurlbut. And, um, and then, you know, we um, invite you as questions come up um, to put them in the question and answer field. Um, and we'll give her some time to have her questions first, but then we'll move to audience questions as well. So thank you so much. All right. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Hurlbut, for being here. Just in this past um, pre-event discussion, he was talking about going to dinner with people like Francis Collins and Shinya Yamanaka, who I've only seen in my textbook. So this is really an honor for me to get to talk to you. Um, I thought we would start broadly in um, accordance with the title of the seminar, The Boundaries of Humanity. Uh, I wanted to ask you, in what ways are you noticing scientific advances blurring the boundaries between humans, animals, and machines? Um, and what challenges do you think that this blurring poses for our existence, especially as Christians, as, as people of faith? I think that the challenges are very broad and very fundamental, and therefore they involve all of humanity, but it's it's especially as Christians with a vision of the created order, um, we need to take a special concern for these, question, these questions. The, there was a report put out by the National Intelligence Council a few years ago called Global Trends 2030. And in that report, they said, and this is a quote, we are at a critical juncture in human history, which could lead to widely contrasting futures. And that's why we need wisdom, because our power is increasing. It's a rising scale of freedom and peril. And that power and that peril come from the fact that we have moved on from increasing knowledge, sort of revolutions in physics and chemistry, onto biology now in the 20th century and now in the 20th first century into control of human biology in ways never even imagined by previous generations. And the previous revolutions opened up ability to manipulate and alter the natural world um, beyond us, the environment we dwell in. And we didn't do such a great job on that in some ways. And here we are at the early edge of this revolution and it's a unique opportunity to pause, ponder, and get our bearings. And as far as possible, frame up these, these considerations, both in their practical application and their conceptual impact with the most profound understanding we can get. And for me, that, that I think is the Christian faith because that's mm -hmm. what guides my understanding of the very source and significance of existence. Yeah, absolutely. You know, as, as a recently graduated bioengineering student and alum, 
of, um, of Christian Union, I've, I've been striving to ground my path in biotechnology and how can I innovate scientifically in a way that is pleasing and glorifying to God. Um, but of course, there's also this question of when does innovating and, and pushing the boundaries of science become interfering with God's creation? Um, and so I think the question at the core of it all seems to be what role does technological innovation play um, or should, should it play uh, in our existence as humans, as a species made uh, in the image of God? Well, we're, we're made in the image of God, which is a, somewhat of a mysterious, um, raises a mysterious question, what does that mean? But one thing it certainly means is that God is good and God is love. And God is reason in the sense, the very concept of the word of God the word logos means an account or a fullness of, of coherent reason. And if we're going to live according to the widest and deepest vision of the world, we have to, we have to seek that to, to guide us and, and to help us figure out what to do with our technologies. Because we are a creature who by, its, by our very nature alters the world. Our, our designation in the book of Genesis was to be keepers and tillers of the garden. But everybody knows that, that we're not dwelling in the Garden of Eden. We're dwelling in a, in a mysterious order where there's suffering and sadness, what St. Paul calls futility. The, the, the world groans in turmoil. We, we await the the consummation of, of a renewed harmony, a new creation. The mystery is how does our technology relate to that? Now, I'm a physician and I, I, I know there are disorders in nature that go all the way down to the most fundamental molecules, all the way up to the most comprehensive mental operations of human beings. Um, all the way from genetic diseases to psychiatric diseases and to social diseases in a way. We have social contagions. And so the idea of intervening is just part of my professional training. But for most of our, our history, we couldn't do much. And where we could intervene against diseases, it was uncontroversial. Now our powers, as we gain understanding of the basic physiological and anatomical um, operations of the human being, all the way from molecules to the fullest expression of our nature, we're gaining control at some degree and it'll increase dramatically over the very operation of not just the rectification of, of pathologies, but, but the very operation of normal everyday human life. We've already seen some of this and it's just a little hint of where it's all going. We, we all know that birth control pills, for example, were, were, they were not thought about very, very much in the very beginning. By the way, I, I taught in the, in the program in human biology, one of my colleagues invented the birth control pill, that's Carl Jurassic. And he was very go-go on this. It was, this was a great boon to humanity, but I think anybody can see that it raised, that kind of control over our bodies raised very, very complicated issues from which we're just seeing the, the echoes and the outplay of them in our own age. And that's just one tiny example. Well, it's a very major central one, but we've got all sorts of interventions now. It's called lifestyle drugs, starting with um, Rogaine that treated, treats baldness, which, uh, you know, when I was a medical student, baldness wasn't even considered a disease. Now it's a, it's a multi-billion dollar business, the treatment of it. And I'm not saying I, th that I'm condemning that. I, mean, I think people, don't, who want to have more hair, that's, I guess that's okay with me, but I was lucky I still have mine. But, you know, it's a question of what level of operation against our bodies is legitimate and what will lead us in a way that derails and erodes the basic human strengths. Yeah, I think that actually ties directly into my next question. Um, this idea of should we alter human physiology to um, to increase our sensory range or for self-improvement or aesthetic purposes um, to extend the human lifespan, right? Um, where, where is this boundary between um, 
um, doing things to heal uh, debilitating diseases. I'm thinking of all of my genetic engineering, tissue engineering classes where um, we're learning how to re-splice neurons um, or treat defective genes. Um, so, so there's this question of uh, will biotech mediated enhancements of physical and mental powers, not, not just healing, um, open new horizons for our ability to exist as humans or um, rather disrupt fundamental aspects of our, our humanity as we were created. Yeah, that's the, that sums the dilemma very well, Angelica. I, I think we, we have a spectrum of attitudes toward this in our society right now. And that's probably healthy because at this point, our interventions, we can't do all that much yet. It's just that we see it coming. And, and if, if we would pause and, and deal with this in a thoughtful way, we might anticipate and preempt some of the, the unfruitful and even negative degrading uses of this technology. But the spectrum of attitudes are they're sort of what's labeled Luddite. And you know, the Luddites have something to be said for them. There's a, there's a, there's a sense in medicine, there's the fundamental principle of medicine, above all, do no harm. And, and as a Hippocratic tradition. And we know in medicine that when, when you intervene in the human body, you always get byproducts or side effects that you didn't anticipate. And so th this is a very cautionary concern, and that's very prominent in the European civilization right now toward biotechnology, precautionary principle. In our own society, we're much more go-go, especially in Silicon Valley, where there's Silicon Valley is characterized by fast forward, you know, <laughs> and there's, it's amazing culture because there's this preoccupation with, with um, re-engineering reality and and uh, increasingly, as a, a whole civilization, perhaps globally, we're seeing life's challenges as, as engineering problems. And when it comes to biotechnology, these, these are considered something we can operate on at the molecular level or the neurologic level. That's, first of all, I think that's a rather superficial and, and false paradigm on which to, to operate. Nonetheless, that's, that's a very, strong operation in our current thinking. And the, the first extension of this is a transhumanist society, which is a global um, group dedicated to genetically engineered um, future. They envision the human future as machine humans, cybrids um, operating in, with capabilities that are just way beyond the grasp of our current expression of human nature. So what are we and what happens when we get control and we can re-engineer ourselves? There's, there's this whole feeling emerging that we, that we might be able to move on to some kind of deeper flourishing or fuller, more satisfactory lives, some kind of technological transcendence that would, would be the, the destiny of human nature. And against that is the mystery of how our nature is deeply embedded in, in the ecology of the earth, how our interactions and internally the, our parts and processes, our interpersonal re relations might, might cut well below our understanding and we could disrupt things, walk ourselves right off of the, the stage of our deepest and fullest flourishing and fall and degrade ourselves. That's the dilemma. Is the dilemma? The dilemma. Um, how are we re-engineering ourselves? Uh, not only ourselves, but um, we're creating new things. I wanted to get a little bit into machines um, and the ethical issues that arise with artificial intelligence, brain-computer interfaces. Um, these are classes that I've taken. We're learning how to um, how to build these things. Um, and so I just wanted to ask you, you know, what, what do you make of it um, from a Christian perspective, from a physician's perspective? Um, what are we to make of, of predictions of these so-called conscious machines? Well, as you heard from the introduction, I'm, I'm um, co-leader of a project at Stanford, Boundaries of Humanity, Humans, Animals, and Machines. And we are contending with those questions. And we have major figures from Silicon Valley involved in this project. And I've had deep conversations with them. And, you know, Stanford professors were the, 
training ground for the founders of, of major um, corporations in America. Uh, one of the people involved in our Boundaries of Humanity project is a guy named Terry Winograd, who was the mentor for the guys who founded Google. And when you talk with a guy like that, it's very interesting and very sobering um, to see what the general public is being told versus what the actual realities of, of, of the um, state of information technology are and the misunderstandings that are being promulgated by the press largely, because it sounds exciting as sort of challenging and <laughs> gets attention. But there's all sorts of talk about creating machines that have human consciousness. Now, I, we don't know what human consciousness is. Maybe you do, Angelica, with all your neuroscience training. You, you, you can't tell us either, right? That's one of, the, one of the things that people in neurobiology, and my appointment at Stanford's in the Department of Neurobiology, and you talk with, I talk with my colleagues, and they, they, they have ideas about how consciousness arises biologically, but what they can't explain is the mystery of subjective self-awareness. And, and that we, that's, first of all, a very sobering comment because we don't really know how the most obvious things to us arise. Um, you know, Descartes said, I, 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 th I think, therefore I am. Um, one of my students rephrased it and says, I said, I feel, therefore I'm real. But we don't know how we feel. Um, we don't know what animals feel, and we certainly don't know what machines feel. But I can tell you that that um, it's it's. I think the issue of machines is much easier to contend with the than the issue of animals, because it's it, it's never really been a been a a question that we are animals, and that animals share some of the qualities of our nature. But what about machines? It, it's if, if we are machines of some complex organic sort, it's kind of disturbing that the, that the sheep, we may not even be able to make machines that are like us. So what does it mean when, when we read a quote like this quote from a guy named Alan Newell, when he says, our minds are a technology like other technologies in being a set of mechanisms for the routine solution of a class of problems. And, and well, we, that, that's a very challenging statement, isn't it? Our minds are a technology. You, Angelica, when you were being trained, you've, you, you heard some of those kind of statements, right? I'm sure. Yes, certainly. Um, we were talking about, you know, the, the spectrum for, uh, of automation. Uh, this, for those who are unfamiliar, there are stages of automation um, that we can program into machines uh, to a degree of how much can they think on their own without any human instruction. Um, and we, at one point, drew a chart of, of what are the unique defining features of, of, of humans um, and what, what is different for machines. And it is a little disturbing when you see some of them cross over. Um, but I wanted to get your opinion, Dr. Hurl, but uh, what do you think are the unique and defining features um, of, of human nature? Well, one of the fun things about this challenging era we're in, and by the way, I, I think this is going to be a very exciting era to be in because I think what's going to happen is we're gonna to start to appreciate the majesty and the mystery of our nature. And as a result, we're going, to, we're going to have a deeper appreciation of what we are and what the strengths of our nature are that ought to be emphasized by our social and even our technological interventions. And I think when you stop, and, and I'm glad you started with machines because when you look at the difference between a human being and a machine, it's you know right away that it doesn't doesn't quite fit the mold of what we would call a technology. Mm -hmm. There's something not quite right there. That's something's been smuggled in without our really noticing it. And um, if you really ponder it, you realize the human mind is an embodied mind, mysteriously issuing forth from within a living organism, that we are inseparably body and mind, that we're a psychophysical unity. Uh, that's the way we experience ourselves. Sometimes we, we feel like we're just minds, and then other times we feel like we're just bodies, especially when we're in pain. But, but, but we always come back to the fact that we are, we are mysteriously both. 
And, and it seems pretty plain that unless we're quite wrong about it, it seems evident that the mind is, is materially mediated so that our body has something to do with the sense of our self present there. I, that's certainly an assumption I operate with methodologically, at least. I'm always open to the idea that I'm not even my body at all, that I'm sort of <laughs> some kind of avatar for some mind somewhere, but it doesn't re feel real to me. It feels like I am my body. And in part, I'm more than my body, but I'm mysteriously engaged deeply and integratedly with my body. And therefore, there is a kind of mechanism involved. And therefore, there's a sort of technology, if you might call it a biotechnology. But even if the mind is mysteriously um, materially mediated, it's more than a mechanism, at least as we use that word, it, it's, since it, it apprehends and draws into awareness concepts and ideas, immaterial realities that are real or more real than the material body itself or the materials of which the body operates. And so the mind is internally operated. It's not just externally ordered like a, a human created machine. I think it's the first thing that, that characterizes human nature and we are an embodied creature and therefore we need to take seriously what it means and then we ask ourselves what kind of an embodied creature are we and and that's that's where the the next step in this this kind of thinking has to go i think right i i think so as well um uh tying it into the the animals portion uh, some people might say, you know, are humans just another ordinary animal species? Um, and uh, this question of, you know, uh, our minds and this heightened level of consciousness definitely plays um, plays into that um, in terms of how we are how we are set apart. Um, I wanted to circle back to faith just a minute. So um, just because I am conscious that this is a Christian Union event, uh, I think. Um, a question for the times. Uh, there's there seems to be a degree of of mistrust that we're seeing not only among Christians but just people more broadly regarding science, um, technology, vaccines, and and there's this genuine concern that science is becoming um, a, a god or an idol in some academic or medical communities. Um, so I think a question, at least on my mind, and maybe some other audience members' mind, is uh, how can faithful people both appreciate and honor the contributions of science while also holding on to God's sovereignty. I, it's sort of a tragedy that there's this conflict between faith and science. For one thing, at least in the Western world, and I think it's pro probably the major thrust of scientific process, the science, science arose out of a Christian culture. It, it arose out of a culture that was sensitive to the order in creation attention to the, to the very core processes. And, and it was a way of seeing the world that emerged upwards through figures like Albertus Magnus and Thomas Aquinas. And, and people may, may not realize this, uh, Roger Bacon was a Franciscan, Galvani was a Franciscan, uh, Boyle was a, was a religious man, Newton was a religious person. And some of the major early discoveries in, in science were grounded in a way of looking at the world that depended on the notion that there was ordered creation and that it was not just ordered, but it was intelligible, that human beings were capable of penetrating into its, to its operations and understanding its varied kinds of causes. And, you know, it's a very mysterious thing because how long our species has been around is, is debated. But we've certainly been around for many thousands of years. There, they found a basket over in an excavation site in Israel, a beautiful basket that I saw in the in the uh, news this week is ten thousand years old. And people have been thinking about things a long time. Why did it take so long to to organize this thrust of scientific knowledge? And I mean, you had to have metallurgy and a few things to really do good science, but. Still, there was a way of seeing the world, I think, that operated. And so fundamentally, I don't believe faith and science should be in, in conflict. There's conflict over interpretations of science, but one has to realize that science is a subset of knowledge. 
is like a little island in a mm. great sea of mystery. And it's got its own limited methodology. There's ways to understand the world that science uses that are not the only ways to understand the world. And great scientists and great thinkers like, like uh, Michael Polanyi, for example, has pointed out that we're, we're, we're mysteriously, um, we operate with our minds in relationship to the world in far more than, than with the tools of science. So anybody who thinks that science uh, should displace their faith ought to go back and, and read some of these writers and ponder how little science actually knows of the mysteries of the universe itself. Even its own sphere, it doesn't know that much. And, and um, so th that's just in response to the negativities as to the uses of science and engagement of science. Not only does, does Christian, shape, Christian understanding shape our perceptions and our advances, but it guides us into the larger coherent integrated unity of creation. And therefore it tells us that the ways we approach our science must be in concert with and coordinated with those other things we do know. You know, earlier we were talking about the uses of technology and the challenges. It's pretty plain to me that Jesus said, be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. Well, I think that means be perfect in love. And that seems to me the, the first and foremost principle of the guidance of biotechnology, that all of our technology technologies should be used for more love, not less love. I will be hanging on to that last statement for a long time. It, that definitely resonated with me. Um, I, I agree that you know our, our current science doesn't have to be at odds with um, our long-standing religious ideas. Um, maybe it just takes a little bit of a, a shift in perspective. Um, but nevertheless, um, I wanted to ask. Um, what, what advice you would give for faithful people um, trying to assess new technologies, new technologies to see um, if they're in line um, with, with God's will? Well, prayerfully, <laughs> keeping one's spirit aligned. I mean, Definitely. the mystery of Christian faith is, is that it transcends the structured law, in, not in the sense that it that erases the law, it fulfills the law with the spirit. The spirit is flexible and adaptive and contextual to some extent. I'm not promoting situation ethics. I'm just saying that everything is complicated. And the more comprehensive understanding and more integrated understanding you can bring to bear on any issue, is that's the best way to approach it. Christianity, to my faith for me, aligns my life and my mind according to what I think are the deepest purposes of existence. And if I prayerfully align myself with that, as I begin the day and go, walk through the day, um, then, then all the responses to the circumstances that I encounter will be informed by that. And that's the way I think we need to, to contend with our science, engage our science within the context of the larger perception of, of what is good and right and true and beautiful. That's, that's the way we need to operate. And it's hard to believe that, that the, the world doesn't hold possibilities that we haven't even touched, that, that we haven't appreciated. I mean, every once in a while I read that passage in the Bible where Jesus, I guess he just cured a blind man, or I can't remember what it was, but anyway, he says, these things I do, ye too shall do. And I just wonder if if Jesus understood that the possibilities, if we just had the right alignment and, and understanding, the things we could do are, are extraordinary. I mean, so, it's so powerfully moving to go into a place like Stanford Medical Center and see the good that's being done. It's, it, it's just powerfully moving. You, you can't help but believe it, it, it belongs to the realm of, of God and his, and his love playing out through other human beings, even be, human beings who don't, consciously understand the source and significance of the world the way Christian believes he does, he or she does. It's, it's, it's in, alignment, in alignment with the good. I love that. You know, all good things come from God. That's how I, I try to steer my, um, my career journey as it's just starting. Um, 
just to end before we pass it off to open Q&A, um, I'd just love to hear about your faith journey um, as well as um, how it's intertwined with your journey to where you are um, at this intersection um, and just how it's impacted your work. Well, I, I think like probably many people on, on this, this Zoom meeting, I, I was not always, um, I wasn't really brought up solidly in faith. I was sort of forced to go to Sunday school. And I, I became a Christian during my years as an undergraduate at Stanford, where I, I was somewhat of a kind of new left radical student. And I, I watched what it, the, what was happening from it. And that, you know, and it, it just wasn't happy. It wasn't heading in a good direction. I could see that. And people were getting more and more angry and people didn't really have real solutions. They had a lot of criticisms. Um, a lot of hatred was operating. Um, a lot of good moral challenge was emerging while I was an undergraduate. But, but what they didn't have was, was anything to change the heart of the individual. They had social solutions, political solutions. And one day when there was a very, very disruptive demonstration against the Vietnam War at Stanford, I went back to my, my little home, the house where I was living, and I took the Bible out of my shelf that my mother told me I had to take with me when I went to college. And I gotten it from my confirmation class, but I, was, I didn't understand it at all when I was in high school. Good people, but I wasn't open. And I started reading the Gospels, and that, that combined with listening to Bob Dylan and reading Dostoevsky, I finally knelt on my living room floor and prayed that God would open me my understanding because I still didn't know what to make of it. But then my life changed for that, which was a great joy to me because it was like suddenly things started to make sense and my life opened up. It was just dr dramatic and mysterious. And I think probably many of people here have experienced that same thing. It was very, very real. I, I don't, I, I didn't especially want to be a religious person. I didn't like all the religious people I knew. And, and yet there I was. So, so I, so C.S. Lewis who said kicking and screaming. I wasn't exactly doing that, but I, 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 I didn't know what to make of it. And, and by, by God's grace, he pulled me into it. I'm so grateful because it's been the central alignment of my whole life. That's so wonderful. That's, that's absolutely wonderful to hear. Very um, just inspiring and resonant. Um, I think we do have a couple questions. Thank you so much for fielding all of mine, <laughs> Dr. Um, Roman. And Angelica, thank you. I mean, I thought there was we such a beautiful give and take between the two of you. And I love you jumping in with your own, um, your own thoughts about it. Um, Angelica, do you want to handle asking the questions or do you want me to jump in? Sure. Are you able to see them in the Q&A? Okay, great. Yep, I figured it out, the like, Zoom interface. Oh, no. Good. All right. So um, someone would like to know, um, do you think the Hippocratic practice of medicine is the most closely aligned to Christianity? Are there specific areas where medical practices often stray or fall short? The Hippocratic corpus and and nobody knows exactly what came from Hippocrates himself but it's it's got great depth of beauty in it and consistency I think what the reason it does is because when you're a physician you you start to have a certain respect for the natural world and Galen the the first century Roman physician summed this up by saying the physician is only nature's assistant. And, and the Hippocratic Oath, is it, it's got a range of things that are both practical, um, kind of social and spiritual in them. But the central tenets of it are, are really true to what you experience when you're practicing medicine. And so, uh, for example, I, I would not give a deadly drug to a patient. Because when you practice medicine, you realize very quickly that your special calling is, is not to decide ultimately in everything about a person's life, but you are a healer. You are dedicated to life in all of its expressions. And I think the same goes for abortion. 
I didn't know what I thought about abortion when I entered medical school. But the first time I saw an abortion, I, I was very deeply affected by it. I, I went in, I scrubbed in on a procedure that, that a private physician was doing. And it was labeled in the medical records as a kind of a tumor because there, it, abortion was illegal in those days. And when it was a suction abortion, they collect the parts in a, in a suction device with a filter um, because if you leave parts of the fetus in the womb, they, they get necrotic and, and cause infection and sterility. So they have to line the parts up afterwards. And when he stopped the suction abortion and started lining the body parts up of the fetus, he stood in front of me and I couldn't see what he's doing. He went over the water faucet. He came back. He knew I'd been debating this question of abortion. He went, came back and he opened my palm, my hand and plunked into it, this little tiny fetus with the head and the arms and legs had been ripped off, but I could see the, the, the little tiny ribs, the little tiny pelvis, the little spine, and this little, little three inch long embryo. And I, I just, tears well up in my eyes. I knew this is not, not why I was being a physician to do this. And that had a very big impact on me. And and so, so what I'm saying is you, you learn in medicine what your role is by seeing real lives and seeing real patients. And at least for me, that's that aided by my faith has, has guided me in what I am willing to do and what I think we should do with our technologies. Absolutely. And I think that actually ties really well into this question um, by an anonymous attendee, considering that biotechnologists will continue to push the boundaries. Um, for example, with CRISPR babies, do we have an obligation as Christians to pursue um, support exploration of these frontiers to ensure that it happens ethically? I, as you heard from the introduction, I, I did a program a four-year project with Jennifer Doudna, who just got the Nobel Prize for inventing CRISPR-Cas9, which is a major, major discovery. I and mean, this, is, this is a very dramatic moment in biotechnology because genetic engineering was invented just shortly after I graduated from Stanford Medical School. One of my teachers, Paul Berg, got the Nobel Prize, partly for his discoveries in that and other things. But this was largely done at Stanford and UCSF um, Medical Center. And so I was very familiar with this. And there was great hope that genetic engineering could fast forward medicine, that we could do all sorts of interventions against the many dread genetic diseases and, uh, and, and, and that we could do genetic interventions that would just treat a whole range of diseases. And, and that was the great hope. First of all, our, our understanding of genetics is has advanced and it's a lot more complicated than, than that simplistic vision in the beginning would have had it. But, but the main impedance to it all was the lack of an effective gene editing tool. And when Jennifer and Emmanuel Charpentier from France discovered this new method of gen gene engineering, it became obvious to people in science all over the world that they now had a new tool for, for probing and it's scientifically and understanding biology and also potentially therapeutically. In the first, first two years after the discovery of this, there were something like 5,000 scientific papers using this technology. It was very dramatic. You probably used it, Angelica, in your, your training. Of course. So here we are suddenly with new powers that we just barely have thought about because they had been sort of on the back burner for the last 50 years because they, they hadn't evolved in power as much as they'd hoped. Suddenly, I'll give you an example of this. I know the, the, the scientist who did the first um, genetic engineering of a mouse, mm -hmm. and, and it's Rudolf Janisch at MIT. And he, what he did, I had dinner with him a while back, and he told me, well, what I did took two years of a postdoc's time, $200,000, and we changed one gene. Mm -hmm. And he told me that, that today, for $2,000 in three yep. weeks, he can change six, eight, 10 genes at a time. So you can see 
just for the cost and efficiency and speed, it's a fast tool. Its power to intervene yes. spans not just direct operations on the DNA, but on all of its subsequent genomic processes. You know, DNA produces RNA and RNA produces proteins. And there are now ways to silence the production of proteins and so forth. So it's going to be a fantastic tool. Absolutely, we want to use this tool in a constructive way. But Jennifer, to her credit, realized that this had opened very, very profound questions. The most, mm. perhaps the most immediate and profound one is whether we should do germline genetic engineering, mm. whether we should alter people's genes in, in um, when they're very, very early in development so that it would then translate into their own children and grandchildren as well. You must have heard a lot about this when you were in school, right, Angelica? Mm -hmm. We were required to. Um, that's something I admire about the curriculum now. We had uh, two years of bioethics incorporated in the training, which I think is just as well that we're doing that alongside, um, like writing our own uh, uh, potential reports or NIH grants about changing 10, 12 genes um, in order to, to achieve a certain goal. So I think it's, it's definitely important work. I admire the people um, out there. Who are, who are putting the time in to, to be these voices in those communities. Um, Christopher White put a question in the chat. Um, it seems at times that the media are the promoters of the most extreme possibilities of science, that scientists themselves have a more realistic perspective on what is possible. Can you comment on this? Well, I think that's definitely true. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, I think even since I was educated in medical school, it's almost scandalous what's happening the, the earliest scientific results, which are preliminary, they may not even be correct, are, are put forward, promulgated now with the internet in a matter of hours. You can read about a scientific paper worldwide. And the, the uh, makes good story because they often are about things that people care a lot about, but it doesn't make very good public understanding of science, and, and there is a lot of good scientific journalism, I have to say that, but there's a journalist wants his pieces to get read and a paper wants the pieces Thanks. to be exciting. And, and so there's a there's sort of a, a, a wrong motive operating. <laughs> what can we do about it? Well, one thing we can do about it is realize just what you said and get a little bit more educated. And that's part of what our Boundaries of Humanity project is going to do. We're going to put up a major website that gives people proper information, cautionary concerns about just swallowing things whole without examining them and asking what's really true here. What does this really mean? You know, a lot of people are desperate for medical cures and a lot of people worried about things like, like um, Alzheimer's disease. And of course, um, a lot of people interested in any technology that might allow you to live longer. And um, I debated this guy, Aubrey de Grey, um, at a forum sponsored by the San Francisco, San Francisco Chronicle. Aubrey de Grey is a real character. He's got this long beard like Methuselah, and he's promoting the idea. And he, he, in an earlier debate I had with him, he said that he was very confident that if he could just live 35 more years, the science would advance so fast that it would obtain what he calls longevity escape velocity so that it, the gravitational pull of death and aging would not be as great as the advances so he could continue to live longer and longer. He said, if we could live just 35 more years, we can live to be a thousand. Well, I don't think that's good science myself, but, but yeah, I mean, it's interesting and I'm not utterly um, against the idea of doing longevity research. Um, but, but I think we have to be very realistic about how very, very complicated things are. And, mm -hmm. and just a little bit of science will, will teach you that. And then, so we're gonna put up this website in, in six or eight months that really, really explains all that to people. That's great. Um, what you said about the information, um, there's just so much of it too, right? Just varying degrees of quality, but also just a sheer quantity that we have access to. It's as though we're all sort of becoming researchers in our own right now um, with our access to the internet. So it's great that you all are putting together this project to get people the right information. Uh, just a little side note yeah. on what you just said. Yes, absolutely. Uh, my, my wife is a pediatrician and I'm in medicine and I, we both realized that with the internet, Patients come in and they know a lot. Sometimes they know <laughs> things we don't know because they've, you know, you can't carry 
30 or 40,000 diseases in their details around in your head. And if somebody has symptoms, they go on, they, they go to the Google doctor. And, WebMD. And I, I, just yeah. so that your audience is very clear, that's fine, do your research, but also go to your physicians. <laughs> Don't think that you know enough to, to transcend. There's an art to medicine and there's a lot of misunderstanding of medical information from the internet. Oh yes, um, I've definitely been there when I've Googled my symptoms and it tells me that I'm going to die. So go to your doctors, everyone. Um, absolutely. Uh, we do have a, a question in the chat, or not in the chat, but in the Q&A, um, anonymous, although we may not be there now, how do you anticipate discoveries of consciousness or near consciousness in AI or animals affecting um, conversations about humans' uniqueness? About what human? Human's uniqueness, oh, unique human qualities. Uniqueness. Well, let, let me just spend a moment to to try to explain that because it's very, very important that we know, that we understand that machines, at least as they're currently constructed and conceived, are not like human consciousness. But I mean, you have to understand we don't we consciousness is a mystery, so we don't even understand how it how it emanates from within a human person, but. The, the the problem with, as I was saying earlier in the in this conversation, is that our mind is internally operated. It's not just externally ordered like a human created machine. There's a self in there, qualities of consciousness, including subjectivity and sense of freedom that are very unlike a mechanism. Machines do do kind of mathematical processing. They do they sort of do logical computations, um, but in the human mind, there are other kinds of thinking surrounding, suffusing, and strategically being strategically deployed, even when we are doing something that's like raw computation. So there's powers of mind operating that are not like pure computation. Hopes and fears. The, 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 we're sifting through and sorting, searching solutions for meanings, personal significance, all, all this complexity of the human brain is what, what Charles Sherrington called the, the enchanted loom. It's way beyond computation. Uh, it, during the early computational revolution in, in AI, um, Stanford psychologist David Rummelhart famously said, the knowledge is in the connections. And there, that was a very profound statement at the time with regard to how you derive information from a computer, how you hook the connections up, how the switches worked, were performing mathematical processes. But the problem with that statement, however true it may have been of AI, it wasn't an act, it, was, it can't be translated over to mean that the, that the computers are, are really knowing anything. The knowledge in the connections is wrong because there is no knower there. The knower is the human being. And, and subsequently, and even before that too, some very serious scientists have re recognized that our, our knowledge as a human being operates within the context of our embodied nature. We, unlike a machine, we, we know we exist. Um, and even if a machine could in some way know it existed, which is hard to imagine, but even if it did, it wouldn't necessarily have the same kind of existential challenge of knowing it's going to die. Um, mm -hmm. They worry about somebody pulling the plug, but, but, or rusting or something, but uh, it's kind of quite different. The, 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 yes. the guy I mentioned earlier, Terry Winograd, who is a, a, a computer scientist at Stanford, he really puts this all very, very succinctly when he says we're infinitely more complicated than mathematical logic would allow. Mm -hmm. And that this kind of patchwork rationalism. It, now that that was really true of the early computers. The early computers, like everybody knows that that a computer, Deep Blue, I guess it was, beat um, who was it, the Russian chess player. And and but that was sheer computation. I mean, a computer can can in fact think mathematically, directly, linearly, linearly faster than a than a human being can, which is why we all use them now. But but that was just crunching the numbers. That that computer can think out 30 moves. The consequence is 30 moves hence in any given um, chess chess move. And so everybody said, "Oh, it can't do that. It can't. It can do that, but it can't play Go." 
which is you know famous game game in Asia, and because Go involves um, subtlety and sort of more more tacit knowledge, a kind of a mm -hmm. intuitional knowledge, and and then in the last 20, 30 years, there's been the rise of machine learning, kind of kind mm -hmm. of um, deep deep mind, and but there again, that's not. That's not like a human mind. What those the way that technology currently works is it searches out patterns. Now I've got statistics here that will really be interesting. Let me find my paper here. So Go, it took the computer um, 29 million games to get good enough to beat a human being. So obviously more than any human being could ever play. 29 million games, thousands of times the experience of the best players. It, in learning to do this, it used up two megawatts of energy, enough to power a small city. And even to play a single game, the computer uses about two kilowatts, which is about 100 times more than the 20 kilowatts, uh, the 20 watts that are needed to run the human brain. That is just, I'm mean, speaking just operationally here. So not to, not to mention the mystery of how the human being does it. So this, this, so neither of those forms of computation are really much like a human being, and therefore I don't expect consciousness to be arising from machines anytime soon. But I don't know everything, and and I since I don't know what consciousness is, I don't know how it arises either. Right. There's also this element of. Um infusing our own humanity into the machines um, and taking the I, I've been taking these classes about, um, about what kind of biases of our own that we introduce um, when we are teaching these machines to essentially sift out patterns from lots of data. Um, are these patterns that they're identifying could they end up being um, you know untruthful in some in some degrees. Um, so I think that's something that we have to be conscious about as well. Just, you know, but let me comment on that because the, yeah. the computer just, it, it shifts around little icons, little, little numbers, basically. Yep. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't even think in any meaningful sense as far as we, we, we think of thinking. It's, it's, it's just operating on ratios and mathematical equations. And, and, and that's very, very different than what we do. And it's very easy to get the wrong impression because it seems to come up with answers, but the machine that's computing the answer doesn't have any idea what it's about. It doesn't know the context or the content of the question. In fact, the same process could solve completely different questions mm -hmm. um, depending on, you know, might have a similar mathematical structure, but nothing by way of content alike. You see what I mean? Yes. This, this just a little one more exactly. comment about that. Yes. The, this is when we take this notion of, of deep mind for mm -hmm. for computers. What we're basically doing is something that the Harvard professor Richard Lewontin labeled as a process of backwards etymology. We first we use a term of familiarity as a tool for understanding. Oh, if this thing is doing something like a mind. And then we turn around, we do it in reverse order, and we use what that's doing to apply to our mind. And that's a big mistake. Artificial intelligence may in some way be mind-like, but it does not make the human mind computer-like. Mm. Does not make the human mind computer-like. Yeah. Um, that, those are all the questions that we've received. Um, if anyone in the audience would like to um, ask another one, we invite you to put it in the chat. Um, otherwise, I'll pass it back to Christine and Karen. Absolutely. I, Karen and I are behind the scenes saying how perfect this was and um, just how grateful we were to both of you. We said it was, it was like a dance um, with you passing the baton back and forth and just um, really, I, I appreciated what each of you brought to the conversation, and we're just so grateful for the thoughtful, nuanced exploration of really, really complicated topics, um, but in a way that even I, as a layperson, felt like I understood. So thank you for that. Um, yeah. I would love to ask Karen to um, close us out for the evening. So. Yeah, this has just been wonderful. Thank you both so much for your time and for sharing with us. Another thing that Christina were saying behind the scenes is 
we wish this could be printed out. I mean, I feel like we need to capture every one of these words of this conversation and pass it along to the next generation. This, this is, these are critical conversations um, that as, as you both expressed are probably not being had to the level that they should be. So we're incredibly grateful for you. And um, just watching to make sure nothing else pops up before I close us out in prayer. Can I say one thing? Please, yes. I, there's just one final thing I'd love. Oh, please, my, please, take the can floor. You, can you hear me okay? Okay. So just one final comment before you close or whatever we do next. That These challenges are very deep. And just this week, there was a, an announcement that, that scientists have kept, human em they kept mouse embryos alive through half their gestation. Now, they're a lot smaller than human embryos at the same stage. So... But, but the scientists went on to say they want to use human embryos in experimentation. This raises profound questions our society needs to talk about. Otherwise, we're going to end up in a place we didn't want to be, sort of pushing the pedal on the good without recognizing what concerns, the moral concerns, there are. And so there's a, there's a, a, a famous old saying that, that um, when one starts down a road, one should think one starts down the road, one has to be in mind, keep in mind the destination where that road takes you. We go down a road and we, we have to understand where it leads before we start down it. And there's another saying that says, the first principle of intelligent tinkering is not to throw it away any of the parts. You can imagine that if you're going to take apart a, a, a clock or something, you don't want to throw away any of the parts. The same actually goes to some extent for our organic nature. We, we've got to be very careful not to underestimate what we don't understand. The first principle of intelligent tinkering is not to throw away any of the parts. That's definitely true of the physical realities, but I think it's also true of our cultural context in which our scientists, our science is emerging. We must be very, very careful at this juncture where so much power and so much weight is coming into our hands that we not throw away any of the parts that are our cultural heritage, our aesthetic, philosophical, and theological, spiritual traditions are every bit as important. And we must be very, very careful how we proceed. Well, wow, thank you. And you model this so beautifully. We're so grateful that there are voices like yours in this arena. Um, do you, I just wanna open up to you, um, if there's any other thought that you want to put out there that you haven't been asked, is there anything else just kind of burning in your heart that you would like for this particular audience to know that you haven't been asked? Well, one thing that some of your audience might be interested to know is that I got to, I got to be friends with the scientist who did the gene editing on the little twins in China. And he was part of the project that Jennifer Dowden and I did together. And he kept coming to Stanford repeatedly to talk to me about his early work. I did not know that he was going to implant human embryos, but I knew that was his ultimate goal. And I tried to talk to him very carefully about it. And, and when, when I went to the gene editing summit two years ago, most of your audience probably knows it was all over the newspapers. When the, it was announced on, on the way there, it was announced um, by an undercover journalist who figured out that he'd done this. He wasn't going to tell people. But I was going to have dinner with that, that guy uh, after the Gene Summit in Hong Kong two years ago. And of course, by the time the news got out, it was all over the place that the uh, everything, I mean, he was supposed to speak at this conference um, two days after it started. And by that time, journalists from all over the world were there. And he had to be brought on stage with a security detail because people were threatening his life. And he did, he did not do the right thing. I, and I told him he would he, be careful not to do that, the wrong thing. He did it without talking to me about it specifically, but I larger context. But the, the, the lesson of this is that we need general public involvement in these issues. The, the National Academies have called for general public dialogue on these matters. And as, as much as I respect my scientific colleagues, they have a particular focus of understanding, but they're not the whole human family. We need to engage the voices of the workaday folks who raise the children, who struggle against the competitive environments of business, who, 
whose ambitions are for their children to go to the best colleges and so forth. All the people who live the work a day and and parenting a day lives of of human existence, the, the lives of of spiritual concerns, of practical concerns, they need their voices heard in these technologies because if they don't get involved, that's just going to happen unreflectively and and not collectively. So that's part of why we're doing this this outreach project at Stanford. And I would encourage your your audience to take these issues very seriously and spend some time to try to understand them better. Because if you do that, you're going to have an impact on the future. There's that old saying, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. Well, that's because it gets gets its influence early. And I think we should collectively put our our wisdom together early on this. Yeah. That's such a great point, and thank you for raising awareness on that. And that's really our heart at Christian Union, is um, you know pouring into these future Christian leaders and even current Christian leaders. And you know, as iron sharpens iron, so shall one man sharpen another. So this has been just an incredible evening of hearing from you, being challenged by um, yeah, just your beautiful balance of truth, intellect, and also just compassion and gentleness. So so grateful for you and all that you have provided for us tonight and angelica as well it was just a wonderful um, interchange between the two of you so i will um go ahead and close us off in prayer there there will be this is being recorded so if you would like to hear this again if you'd like to pass it along to others who weren't able to make it tonight who um you think may be interested in this please do pass along the link it usually takes about a day or two and it'll be up on our website so let's close the evening in prayer. Thank you. Oh, Lord, we give you such thanks. Um, you are, uh, you're so wonderful in your creation. And I was even just thinking as I'm so impressed by um, hearing from Dr. Hurlbut and also Angelica and the way that they so beautifully articulate these thoughts, God, how beautifully you created them in their mother's womb. Um, the the intellect that they have the the way that they express themselves it's you who's done this and lord you've also disordered the steps of their lives so we thank you for the grace upon their lives we ask for your increased favor on both of them in the name of jesus god that you would open up um, avenues pathways for this message um, to get out just the cautions and the warnings and the the deep thoughtfulness that is going into these questions of bioethics, God, would you make your heart and your mind and your voice um, more audible? God, we want to honor you in everything that we do. And, and those of us who are your people, God, we want to live for you um, and, and be those who rock the world, um, just as was stated. So Lord, take this pick it up into your hands and use it um, for exponentially more than what we even um, expected in planning this event. We pray that it will bring your kingdom to bear. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray this through the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, everyone. Good night. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you for being with us.